but now we know it wasn't. Let's go to work. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day from New York. We're coming on the air with breaking news and a historic moment in Washington. Just minutes from now, Vice President Kamala Harris set to deliver her concession speech at Howard University, her alma mater, after NBC News projected her opponent, President-elect Donald Trump, will return to the White House. The Vice President's remarks will come after she did, uh, did not speak at what was supposed to be a celebratory event for her campaign last night before Mr. Trump took a commanding lead in the Electoral College, with Battleground Wisconsin putting him over the 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. Her remarks will also cap her historically brief a 107-day campaign which began after President Biden dropped out of the race. NBC News also learning that Harris and Biden called the president-elect to congratulate him earlier today and discuss the importance of a peaceful transfer of power. While we await uh, the vice president to come before the cameras, our senior White House correspondent and Gabe Gutierrez is covering uh, the vice president at Howard University. Gabe, what can we expect? Uh, hi there, Lester. Well, as we await the vice president's remarks right behind me, we can tell you that this is the first time that we will see her publicly since yesterday afternoon when she was at a DNC headquarters at a phone bank. But I was here yesterday, Lester, and I can tell you the mood here very different than it was yesterday, at least uh, earlier in the night. We saw just such a deflated crowd here as the returns started to come in. Now, we can tell you that the vice president was at her residence throughout the day and that she was working on her speech. Interestingly, about Biden aide tells me that she really didn't have this type of concession speech fully ready. She had expected instead to have a type of speech where she would tell her supporters to hold on because her campaign really expected uh, this uh, election results process to drag on for several days. But we understand that she did talk to former President Trump um, uh, earlier today. She talked to him about the importance of a peaceful transfer of power and also the importance for him to be a president for all people, for all Americans. Now, also, President Biden also called former President Trump. We're told that he invited the former president, now president-elect, to the White House, but we're still awaiting details on that, on when that might happen. The staff is still working it out right now. Lester, I can tell you there's some cheering behind me. Again, any moment now, Vice President Harris is expected to come out here and deliver her remarks. As you said, very significant location, her alma mater. This is also the place where she announced her bid for president back in 2019. And she has also told interviewers that this, loca this location is very meaningful to her because it was the first time she ever ran for elected office when she was a freshman here at Howard University. And she ran for a representative here at the university. But again, we're waiting for those remarks, Lester, after a very disappointing day for Democrats. All Lester. right, Gabe, we'll ask you to stand by. Yeah, we saw them uh, making uh, last minute looking arrangements there on the stage. So we expect the vice president in just a few minutes. In the meantime, let me bring in Meet the Press moderator, Kristen Walker, our senior national correspondent, Tom Yamas, and our senior Washington correspondent, Hallie Jackson. Tom, let me start with you. Yeah. When we, when I left you guys in the wee hours yeah. of the morning, we were still counting to see if it would be a sweep of the battleground states. What's the latest count? We're still waiting, but as we're watching this and waiting for uh, Vice President Harris to come out, the news has gotten worse for her. Obviously, the ultimate news, she's not going to the White House, but now we've learned NBC News has projected both Wisconsin and Michigan have also gone into Trump's column. He has taken down the blue wall once again. He is the only presidential candidate who's a Republican to take down the blue wall. He's done it twice since 1988. Uh, in modern historical times, we have not seen anything like this. So the news right now getting worse for her. We're still waiting on Arizona and Nevada as the vote is still being counted there. All right, Kristen, let me bring into the conversation. We woke up in a different world today. Mm -hmm. uh, th this, this news is now being absorbed. People trying to uh, tea leaf into the future. What are you hearing? Well, we woke up to a political realignment. We saw that former President Donald Trump, now President-elect Donald Trump, had this incredibly decisive victory in which he expanded his reach and his support among key groups, Latino voters, women voters. In fact, President Biden did better with women voters than Vice President Kamala Harris did. We also saw him expand his reach into some blue areas, some blue counties, Lester, here in New York, in New Jersey, in Illinois. 
things that are frankly being viewed as a wake-up call to the Democratic Party this morning. I have been talking to my sources who say that there needs to be a reckoning within the Democratic Party, that they need to take a hard look at these results and a hard look at why they did not resonate with voters, why their message did not speak to these key voters, working class voters, voters of all uh, different backgrounds, racial backgrounds, and they need to rethink how they are messaging, particularly when it comes to issues like the economy and immigration. And how he is, you flip around the channels today, hear all these discussions about what did he really mean? Things that promises he made that, yeah. that, that have, have been disquieting for many people. What do we know? Uh, it, it looks as though, based on everything that he has said publicly, his second term is likely to start as his first term did. Controversially, he has said on day one he will implement mass deportations. There's an estimated 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. Doesn't say, and has been pressed for specifics. How do you pay for that? Probably billions of dollars. Who actually does it? Who actually executes these deportations? That's not clear. Uh, do you separate families? There's a lot of question marks out there. There's a discussion of who ends up in his inner circle. I think you can expect to see Trump loyalists. Keep in mind that, and, and Kristen and I know this from having covered him in 2017 after Inauguration Day, a day that you were in D.C. for too, Lester. He brought in his first term cabinet. Multiple members of that cabinet departed, have since mm -hmm. argued against a second term for former President Trump. It's not going to look like that in all likelihood this time around. He will bring in people who are loyal to him, people who he is comfortable with in his orbit. You can expect to see people like immigration hardliner Stephen Miller. You can expect to see in his broader orbit MAGA firebrand Steve Bannon. You can expect to see people like Elon Musk, people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., perhaps in charge of health agencies here as former President Trump has President-elect Trump now has had him on the campaign trail. Um, other policies. He wants to essentially overhaul the federal government, do away with the Department of Education, look at ways to cut costs dramatically. It could be a, a real sea change in the way that the government works and functions with political opponents concerned about the possibility of retribution. As President-elect uh, Trump said just a few days ago on the campaign trail, it may look, in his words, nasty, especially at the beginning as he comes on board here as we look ahead to January and February. I'll tell you that in my text message, messages and phone calls even in the last few minutes here it is all about on the republican side what's the transition like who ends up in which positions there's the jockeying who's the chief of staff who's the who, who goes up for the secretary of this or that there's a lot of discussion about the next step forward in the future here i'm also interested to see what vice president harris will say here we saw former congresswoman republican liz cheney just today say listen we have a democracy there is a new president-elect we will work to protect the constitution does the vice president strike a similar tone and talk about yeah. upholding the importance well, I mean, of the obviously she'll concede the race question will she concede some of the, 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 the things we're now talking about about the democratic party and how it viewed the electorate up until last night i doubt that her speech will look into the strategy of her campaign but i do anticipate as ali saying as liz cheney her republican supporter signaled earlier today that she will try to strike a unifying tone. And as we sit here and watch the crowd gather at Howard University, I can't help but think of all the parallels to 2016 when Hillary Clinton came out the day after mm -hmm. Donald Trump effectively won and delivered a concession speech that she had not written because she was not prepared to lose. Now, that's not to say that Harris was entering this election with the same sense of what I think some people felt was a bravado on the part of Hillary Clinton. But Hillary Clinton said in her concession speech, I hope that he, Donald Trump, will be a successful president for all Americans. Hillary Clinton very notably struck a unifying tone in her remarks. And so it was such an important moment for the country when she did that. It was such a stark contrast with 2020 when former President Donald Trump did not concede. He still has not conceded. He did not attend the inauguration, Lester. So this was a very different transition of power that we witnessed in 2020 and obviously beset by the violence of January 6th. I do think that the vice president, and I've been talking to lawmakers and they say they are anticipating yeah. and hoping they hear that. Tom, and, and we should acknowledge this, right? Because it, along what Kristen was saying, I mean, the Democrats, no one likes to lose. Every Sunday yeah. we root for our football teams to win. Americans love winners. We love the fight. But Democrats right now are showing how to lose, right? President mm -hmm. Biden called former President Trump, President-elect Trump, as I should say now, 
uh, Vice President Harris called President-elect Trump. You said it, Lester. I, I wrote this down. The peaceful transfer of power. We're not going to see what we saw four years ago. We don't expect yeah. to see that when the U.S. Capitol was turned into a crime scene. That's not going to happen. Obviously, the stakes are much different now. But we should acknowledge Democrats are, are saying goodbye the way it's supposed to be done with that peaceful transfer of power. Yeah, this morning I got up, I took a walk outside, beautiful day, and I was thinking everything is normal, that this will happen in the way that, that we would expect it to happen, a peaceful transfers, transition. It's so true, Lester, and when you go back in history, not just to Hillary Clinton's concession speech, think about the concession speech of the late Senator John McCain, which will go down in history, I think, as one of the most important moments. It was a hard-fought campaign. Former President Barack Obama became the first black president of the United States. And Senator John McCain in that moment nodded to that, celebrated the fact that this was a history-making moment, and he conceded in this way that was incredibly powerful and graceful. And these moments are so important for our democracy because after the hard-fought campaign, to be able to come out, to be able to say to your supporters, we gave it everything we have, we have differences on every single issue, fundamental differences, but now we come together as a nation. Let it's me get really to uh, Garrett Hake if I can, Brad. He's with the uh, president-elect near his campaign headquarters in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, Garrett, what more do we know about the conversation that took place between uh, the president-elect and the vice president? Well, very little, candidly, Lester. We know that it was the vice president who initiated that call sometime early this afternoon. I think there was a lot of expectation in Trump world about when that call would occur. Once the writing was on the wall late last night, a senior Trump campaign official told me they saw the memo that came out last night from the uh, Harris campaign chair urging their supporters to go home and get some rest as a white flag last night, and that they were waiting for this call uh, for some time. One of them suggesting to me that if the shoe been on the other foot and had it not had it been Trump not making a call to concede until well into the next day, they could imagine that the coverage, the reaction uh, from the country would have been quite different. We also learned, of course, about the phone call with President Biden, that invitation to come to the White House. It's important to remember these three individuals here, the Vice President, the President-elect, and President Biden, have almost no actual personal history together. Remember the entirety of Vice President Harris and Donald Trump's uh, personal relationship to the degree they have one was the time they spent together on the debate stage. The two had never met before, hadn't talked subsequently since. And so there's not a lot of relationship here. There does seem to be a desire, at least in this small moment, to project that image of unity and of the peaceful transfer of power, so important to the American tradition in every other election, save essentially the last one. Uh, but now again, a key moment here for, for both sides to try to uh, reach for that higher ground. Yeah, mostly serious faces as we look at uh, at uh, Howard University, where we expect to hear from the vice president her concession speech any minute now. As we wait, let me bring in Simone Sanders, co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend, former chief spokesperson to Vice President Harris. Uh, Simone, have you been in contact with with the vice president's uh, team at all? Uh, Lester, I think I will just say that I, I've spoke to people that know, and um, in general, who not necessarily people who are staff, but people who are very aware of and familiar with um, the just kind of how the tone and tenor is for the vice president, for the president, for folks at the White House right now, and where I, I think what you will expect to hear from uh, the vice president is. Uh, a, a, a thankfulness for the supporters and the, the the people that came out to support her last night who are there today standing there and all across the country but also um, uh, just a, a a sense that the coalition that she built and the time that she did it uh, she doesn't regret and she means what she said about the country about democracy um, I don't know if it will particularly be long uh, a long speech but the folks around the vice president and, and people close to the campaign they do feel like that she 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 ran her race and she left it all on the field and I have to say as someone that watched this from the outside in I do think that the vice president specifically she was a warrior here and definitely ran through the tape um, what we will see in the weeks and months to come when we get the voter data and whatnot is exactly why that was not enough but she I definitely think she gave it her all yes Simone it, it's notable she didn't talk a a lot about you know being a woman, the historic mm -hmm. nature of being a, a, a African American, a South Asian woman, but 
There will be young women who will be watching this speech today. Do you believe she'll have a message for them, those who feel this crushing disappointment that once again the glass ceiling remains intact? Uh, yes, I think she might. Again, I don't know specifically about her remarks or my, from my understanding are very close hold. So I have not seen a version of the remarks and have not spoken to anyone, frankly, that would have seen them. But in knowing the vice president, she has spoken extensively during the time that I worked for her and when I, and when I no longer worked for her, but in the times that I had seen her and whatnot, um, about the place that she has in history. She understands that. She also understands what it means um, for not just young women across the country, but young men when they see her she under she un uniquely understands that so there are people that are crushed um, um, by by this by this not win by this loss frankly and I think she's gonna speak to them the woman I will just note at the podium right now is April Vad Opal Vadhan Opal has been with the vice president since her the first year in office um, and she always sets her remarks out so Kamala yeah. Harris is not far behind. So the remarks are on the podium, so we expect to see her. Why are we waiting? And we may have to break away, but uh, Mark Lauder is the former director of strategic communications for Trump's 2020 campaign. Uh, Mark, uh, this is an, an, an opportunity, certainly, to, for both sides to demonstrate a, a sense of unity. What do you think we'll see uh, from the president-elect in terms of dialogue, further dialogue uh, with the, the Harris team? Well, they'll obviously go through the transition planning, uh, and as she obviously is the sitting vice president, he'll work. Uh, their teams will work together, uh, not only with President Biden and the current White House staff, with the vice president staff. A and I do think this is a moment. I also think it's a moment because of the not only the historic nature of the win, but also what appears to be a national uh, popular vote win, which is something that's not been done but once this century by a Republican. And I think they know that. The, also, the big change. I think we're going to see moving forward, and I was on the 2016 campaign in the transition. It, you kind of left campaign election night going, what next? Mm. Well, they know what next, because so many people, whether it was a Jason Miller, whether it was a Dan Scavino, so many of those senior advisors to the president-elect uh, in his campaign in 24 were also there in 2016. So they know what to do, and they also know you've got one term, to get it done, and I do believe the mandate from the America First movement is we don't want just talk, we want you to actually do the things that you promised to okay, do. Okay, uh, Mark, thanks. We'll ask you to stand by as well as we look at the uh, at the, the camera there pointed at the podium. We expect uh, to see the Vice President momentarily. There comes the uh, uh, still photographer to take the official uh, photographs here. While we do that, Hallie, you're watching along with me. Um, give me your thoughts. This is a significant moment for Vice President Harris, and I'm looking ahead to another one, which will be on Inauguration Day, mm -hmm. uh, because that is going to be the next moment when we will all likely gather and talk about uh, the history-making moment that we're in here. And, and I think about Donald Trump not appearing at Joe Biden's inauguration. President Biden and Vice President Harris will be at the inauguration. Uh, for, by, all, by all accounts, we expect them to be for... for President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Vans. And that is a difficult moment. We're talking about this idea, Tom has brought it up, Kristen has brought it up, of, of Democrats sort of understanding that there is a peaceful transfer of power. Doesn't mean it's easy. Simone yeah. used the word crushing. Uh, and I think that that is exactly what it is for so many Democrats who are grappling with what this means for them, yeah. for the brand, for the, the party moving forward. And just think about the last 100 days of Vice President Harris's life, right? President mm. Biden's out, you're in. Run a campaign for president, which is not easy and it shouldn't be. Uh, debate Donald Trump, uh, come out here now, go through election night, lose a presidential election and come out and face the American people and have to discuss and, and try to push the Democratic Party and the country forward. I mean, it's a lot. And, and I'm sure she's going through a lot. And I'm sure we're going to hear that in her voice tonight. I think that's right. And I think that Democrats writ large are going through a lot right now, grappling with this loss. We're getting this incredibly strong statement from Senator Bernie Sanders, independent senator from Vermont, who says it should come as no great surprise that a Democratic Party, which has abandoned working class people, would find that the working class has abandoned them. What a powerful message Senator Sanders has been saying for months now. We need to focus more on working class people. And the fact that you saw this realignment, That's quite right. frankly, that cut across racial lines, Lester, that cut across socioeconomic lines, 
This is really at the crux of what Senator Sanders is talking about, I think, and what so many Democrats now are going to grapple with. I think there's also going to be a postmortem about what Tom is talking yeah. about, the timing of this, the timing of when President Biden decided to step down. We're already hearing rumblings within Democratic circles of why didn't he step aside sooner? Why didn't he allow her that runway? We to have expect a real to hear from him in, in the coming day yes. here. And I, I'm wondering how far that will go in terms of creating a picture here of unity even afterward. Because you know there's going to be a lot of, lot of finger pointing, a lot of man, we should have, we could have. Absolutely. And it's one of the aspects of all of this that is so unprecedented. Uh, this is only the second time since 1968 that a vice president has run for election after the incumbent has stepped down. And so it, it, the responsibility is on the shoulders of President Biden as well, I think, to strike that unifying It's tone. also fascinating to hear from somebody like Bernie Sanders in this moment, because remember, over the course of the last 107 days, as Vice President Harris largely tacked to the middle on a lot of issues. That was something that came up again and again. She was pressed on the policy differences between her run in 2019 when the Democratic Party was in a more progressive place. People like Bernie Sanders, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez didn't press on that, right? They mm. gave her the space to be mm -hmm. able to move to a more yeah. centrist position, to give that olive branch to more moderates to try to win over those disaffected Republicans. Boy, with that statement from Bernie Sanders, that's done, yeah. that's over. And I think that's a real indication of the grappling inside the Democratic Party that's going to unfold as by the way, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is a hand in so much of this behind the scenes, is here in the audience now at Howard for the speech. Well, yeah, as that camera pan, you see the grim faces there. The crowd has been told about five minutes or so. We will, of course, stay here uh, as we await the vice president to come out and make her concession speech. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez is there on the campus. Uh, Gabe, give us a sense of, of the mood. I mean, we see the pictures, but what's the feeling right now on the ground? Well, hey there, Lester. Well, there is music playing, but nobody is really dancing at all behind me. The mood here is extremely grim. And we just spoke with one Harris supporter just a, a few minutes ago who said that, you know, she was here from New York. She was so excited yesterday at the beginning of the night. But as the returns came in, as it became clear that Vice President Harris was not going to be delivering remarks, she just went home. And for her, it was extremely emotional. You, I, I heard um, you and Hallie and Kristen talking about uh, Hillary Clinton's concession speech back in 2016. Several of the women and in particular that we have spoken here have brought that up as well. Very frustrated that the glass ceiling has not been broken. Now, you were also talking about what we can expect from Vice President Harris, and that's something I will be watching for as well. If you notice, in the last few days of this campaign, when Vice President Harris seemed to suggest that momentum was on her side, she did not message, uh, mention Donald Trump by name. She referred him to him as that other guy, or in many appearances didn't even bring him up at all, trying to hit a positive tone in the last few hours of the campaign. It will be interesting to see if she mentions him by name in his speech. Earlier today, the campaign chair, in a letter to staff, trying uh, to uh, congratulate them for a um, uh, a fight well fought and essentially uh, trying to show them that their, their actions were appreciated over the last several months, but they were up against unprecedented headwinds in her view. But in that letter, she also talked, uh, told those staffers that the fight against the Donald Trump presidency begins now. Unclear if Vice President Harris will go that far. We understand that we do expect her to strike a more unifying tone. But again, these supporters here, we do uh, see some cheering. Uh, behind me, I'm told that uh, Tim That's Walls it. is now Walls, coming yeah. up on stage, and I'm going to send it back to you, Lester. Yeah, we're looking at uh, Tim Walls now. At the f appears to be at the foot of the stage. We assume he will stand uh, with the vice president when she makes her remarks. And for him, somebody who has made this turn onto the national stage, did you know? You know, two months ago, did most of America know who Tim Walls was? If you lived in Minnesota, maybe, right? But now, uh, obviously, he has become a national figure uh, in the audience for the speech as you see some of the family members start to file in the hugs, the sunglasses, the, the crowd here at Howard University. Last time we saw many of them together was, of course, at the uh, Democratic National Convention. Yeah, and I Very think different vibe. raises an important point because Tim Walls joined the ticket. I think many Americans didn't know who Tim Walls was. And you didn't He's see the sort of traditional of media States. blitz that you would expect from him. All right, it's uh, not the, clear more Americans are familiar with The him. vice president has just been announced. We expect to see her in just any second now as she will approach the podium again. Her family, her running mate there. Here is Vice President Kamala Harris.
you all. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So let me say, and I love you back. And I love you back. So let me say, my heart is full today. My heart is full today, full of gratitude for the trust you have placed in me, full of love for our country, and full of resolve. The outcome of this election is not what we wanted, not what we fought for, not what we voted for, but hear me when I say, hear me when I say, the light of America's promise will always burn bright. As long as we never give up and as long as we keep fighting. To my beloved Doug and our family, I love you so very much. To President Biden and Dr. Biden, thank you for your faith and support. To Governor Walls and the Walls family, I know your service to our nation will continue. And to my extraordinary team, to the volunteers who gave so much of themselves, to the poll workers and the local election officials, I thank you, I thank you all. Look, I am so proud of the race we ran and the way we ran it, and the way we ran it. Over the 107 days of this campaign, we have been intentional about building community and building coalitions, bringing people together from every walk of life and background, united by love of country, with enthusiasm and joy in our fight for America's future. And we did it with the knowledge that we all have so much more in common than what separates us. Now I know folks are feeling and experiencing a range of emotions right now. I get it. <laughs> But we must accept the results of this election. Earlier today, I spoke with President-elect Trump and congratulated him on his victory. I also told him that we will help him and his team with their transition, and that we will engage in a peaceful transfer of power. A fundamental principle of American democracy is that when we lose an election, we accept the results. That principle, as much as any other, distinguishes democracy from monarchy or tyranny. And anyone who seeks the public trust must honor it. At the same time, in our nation, we owe loyalty not to a president or a party, but to the Constitution of the United States. And loyalty to our conscience and to our God. My allegiance to all three is why I am here to say, while I concede this election, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign. The fight, the fight for freedom, for opportunity, for fairness, and the dignity of all people. A fight for the ideals at the heart of our nation the ideals that reflect America at our best. That is a fight I will never give up. I will never give up 
the fight for a future where Americans can pursue their dreams, ambitions, and aspirations. Where the women of America have the freedom to make decisions about their own body and not have their government telling them what to do. We will never give up the fight to protect our schools and our streets from gun violence. And America, we will never give up the fight for our democracy, for the rule of law, for equal justice, and for the sacred idea that every one of us, no matter who we are or where we start out, has certain fundamental rights and freedoms that must be respected and upheld. And we will continue to wage this fight in the voting booth, in the courts, and in the public square. And we will also wage it in quieter ways, in how we live our lives, by treating one another with kindness and respect, by looking in the face of a stranger and seeing a neighbor, by always using our strength to lift people up, to fight for the dignity that all people deserve. The fight for our freedom will take hard work, but like I always say, we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work can be joyful work. And the fight for our country is always worth it. It is always worth it. <laughs> to the young people who are watching, it is... <laughs> I love you. <laughs> to the young people who are watching, it is okay to feel sad and disappointed. But please know it's going to be okay. On the campaign, I would often say, when we fight, we win. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Sometimes the fight takes a while. That doesn't mean we won't win. That doesn't mean we won't win. The important thing is don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop trying to make the world a better place. You have power. You have power. And don't you ever listen when anyone tells you something is impossible because it has never been done before. You have the capacity to do extraordinary good in the world. And so to everyone who is watching, do not despair. This is not a time to throw up our hands. This is a time to roll up our sleeves. This is a time to organize, to mobilize, and to stay engaged for the sake of freedom and justice and the future that we all know we can build together. Look, many of you know I started out as a prosecutor and throughout my career I saw people at some of the worst times in their lives. People who had suffered great harm and great pain and yet found within themselves the strength and the courage and the resolve to take the stand, to take a stand, to fight for justice, to fight for themselves, to fight for others. So let their courage be our inspiration. Let their determination be our charge. And I'll close with this. There's an adage and historian once called a law of history, true of every society across the ages.
The adage is, only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. I know many people feel like we are entering a dark time, but for the benefit of us all, I hope that is not the case. But here's the thing, America, if it is, let us fill the sky with the light of a brilliant, brilliant billion of stars. The light, the light of optimism, of faith, of truth, and service. guide us, even in the face of setbacks, toward the extraordinary promise of the United States of America. I thank you all. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. I thank you all. President Kamala Harris, her husband Doug Emhoff, uh, at the conclusion of about a 15-minute speech, the uh, vice president saying uh, that she does concede the race of Donald Trump, and she says, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign, which includes a dignity for all people. If this was a speech, I'll addressing the panel here at large and I'll get you guys to weigh in, uh, this was a speech that did not signal someone who was going to fade away. That, that in her words, this fight will continue. Yeah, do the work is her message, right? Get out there, keep fighting for what Democrats believe in, keep doing it, even in the face, as she said, of setbacks here. As you saw uh, her, her come out and talk about first words there, her heart is full, she said, right? Trying to portray that positivity that she closed her campaign with, saying she feels a lot of gratitude for this moment, but being very clear about what Democrats need to do here, which is continue uh, to keep up the fight against, obviously, the Trump administration, although she talked about a peace transfer of power is going to be essential. They will help, she says, the, the incoming president-elect and vice president-elect in this transition, uh, which is going to be a critical moment. Yeah, the peaceful, the, the peaceful transfer of power, I mean, it's, it's, it's not lost on anyone, of course, that yeah. the, the person that just beat her denied the results of the, of the 2020 election. So there was an admonition, uh, Kristen, built into this. Absolutely. And she made sure to say that when she called president-elect Donald Trump, she stressed the importance of a peaceful transfer of power and that being critical to our democracy. I also thought it was interesting. You asked the question while we were waiting for the vice president to speak. How would she look back on this campaign? Mm -hmm. What would she say about the race that she ran? She said, I'm proud of the race we ran and the way we ran it. Really defending the fact that she was, as you just heard her say, fighting for something larger, freedom, opportunity, fairness, dignity of all people. She, you're absolutely right, sounds like someone who does not plan to fade away and would not be surprised if we saw her on the campaign trail in four years. And Lester, on that, on that point, two thoughts. First, I'm sure, I wonder if there are Democrats out there wondering where was this Kamala Harris for those 100 days? Yeah. We wish we would have seen more of that candidate right there who delivered that speech. That's number one. Number two, we know who the head of the Republican Party is, right? It's President-elect Donald Trump. We know who the heir apparent is. It's J.D. Vance, the, the vice president-elect. Who is the head of the Democratic Party yeah. right now? It is no longer President Biden. It's unclear if it's Vice President Harris. Who's going to step up now for the Democrats? Because one of the victories that President Biden had was that he was able to hold off that red wave in 2022. Yeah. They're facing a red tsunami now. So which Democrat's going to stand up to that red tsunami and change votes? Is it Hakeem Jeffries? I don't know. Maybe it's an outsider. Maybe the Democrats have to go outside their party like the Republicans did. We don't know. We saw Governor Waltz uh, fighting back tears at one point uh, along, yeah. with, along with her family. Obviously a very emotional moment. It was incredibly emotional. And I think Tom raises a really interesting question and it speaks to how this process all unfolded. The fact that there was no primary. Yeah. President Biden stepped down after that really tough debate performance and 
Vice President Kamala Harris was able to essentially solidify support within the Democratic Party around her. There are some within the Democratic Party who will question whether President Biden should have stepped aside sooner, whether they should have held a mini primary process. Could that have made the vice president a stronger candidate, for example? A lot of questions. But this moment, I think, about reflection and again, where we began this conversation about unity, about reminding the country that in this democracy, a peaceful transfer of power is critical to this. I, I wonder if there will be critics who will look at that speech, though, and see that maybe it went a little too far and, and let, it was it was, you know, perhaps a little too strong. Well, she uh, in what sense you, you think? I'm throwing yeah. just the fact that she, you know, she she talked about the peaceful transfer of power, which yeah. you would expect her to, yeah, but yeah. In, under the circumstances. No, that's a good point. That one of the things that stood out to me to this to this end, Lester, is the idea that she talked about the coalition that she feels her campaign yeah. brought together. When in reality, we saw Donald Trump build a coalition that got him the popular vote for the first time since he's ever run for president. Something like. I'll defer to you on the board here. I haven't checked the popular yeah. vote in an hour, but 71 plus million people across America backed uh, President elect Trump and not Vice President Harris. So, to your point, Lester, I think that comes into play here. I also think about the timeline here that this grappling process for Democrats is going to take a while. Mm -hmm. And what may be determinative to some degree is going to be control of the House of Representatives. Yeah. If Democrats are able to establish a bulwark against what they see as uh, the sort of agenda that they do not believe in from the Republican controlled Senate and the Republican controlled White House, that gives them an opportunity opportunity to in some ways push back to to not concede the fight as the vice president put it in her speech if the house goes into republican hands uh, it, it is very difficult to see you know how, what democrats do from here and then the other piece of this i do sense to, to some degree kind of a level of exhaustion among some rank and file mm -hmm. Democrats who have spent the last eight years in the so-called resistance here against former President Trump, had pinned some hopes here on Vice President Harris as she came into the race late into the summer, uh, and who may be just having a moment of, of reeling a bit. But to Tom's point, who will be two will take over? So the, it's a good question. I am not so convinced that we'll see Kamala Harris in, in four years. That might be a, a tough one, uh, I think, for Democrats here. I do think you have uh, up-and-comers inside the party, mm -hmm. including some who are on her short list for the vice presidency. Um, Governor Josh Shapiro. I, I look yep. at Shapiro. I look at Governor Wes Moore of Maryland as somebody else. I look at Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan and yep. some of these critical states here, right, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and beyond, as the people who are going to potentially be heir apparents here. Governor Gavin Newsom of California has made himself a national figure. Uh, in so many ways here. That feels like the generation of Democrats that are coming up here. Um, and and I, it's also a little bit mind-bending, can we just say, to be talking about 2026 and 2028 yeah. Yeah. at this moment. But it's an important question because it speaks to where Democrats go from here. You have year. a news now show to put on. I, I sure do. <laughs> and you have nightly news, too. So I know. I don't mean <laughs> to push rush, you, rush you out the door, but I know you've got this work to do. I want to go back to uh, Gabe Gutierrez at Howard University. Uh, Gabe, give us a sense of what it felt like to be there in that open field, uh, that quad, as, as the speech took place. Well, oh, hey there again, Lester. Well, as you can see behind me, the crowd is thinning out here. And we're watching the video there of uh, Governor Tim Walz getting emotional. We saw several supporters here in that crowd, several women as they were walking away just now with tears in their eyes. And as uh, you and Hallie and Kristen have been talking about, this was a very interesting speech. I, before, it wanted to see how much she would mention former President Trump. She mentioned him just once uh, when she was talking uh, about her phone call with the former president. When his name came up, the crowd booed, but then immediately applauded a few seconds later when she talked about that peaceful transfer of power. Now, Lester, this wasn't so much of a concession speech as it was a call to action, at least in future elections. And it should be interesting to see, as you guys have been talking about, how this plays out within the Democratic Party. But as your campaign chair had said earlier in the day, there is a sense among the Harris campaign that they are already looking forward to the next fight. So in that sense, the speech was not unifying. Still, it was unifying around the idea of a peaceful transfer of power. I think something to look forward to next, Lester, is tomorrow. President Biden is uh, set to deliver remarks here to talk about what's next in the transition. We also understand, as I mentioned earlier, that he did speak with former President Trump earlier today, and he spoke with him about, um, you know, what 
what happens next. And I'll turn your attention back to 2016. Remember those days in the aftermath of that uh, the surprise election back then when uh, former President Obama welcomed former President Trump into the White House. Again, we still don't have any details about when that will happen here. But as we look at these supporters stream out of Howard University, you can see many of them are very emotional, Lester. Yeah, understandable. All right, uh, Gabe, thanks. I want to go to Garrett Hake now. He's uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, I could assume that they were watching here, uh, Gabe. I'm sorry, Garrett. <laughs> that's all right, Lester. We're all going on a lot, not a lot of sleep. I think that's a fair <laughs> assumption, although I will say that the former president has been uncharacteristically quiet since really his acceptance speech and even before then he hasn't posted on social media in something like 18 hours he's been huddling with his team and his family at mar-a-lago i know his team was eagerly awaiting those calls from the vice president and from president biden today i'll be very curious to see what he seizes on from this speech the the opportunity from the vice president to you know talk about a peaceful transfer of power talking about you know, the importance of the American experiment going forward or talking about the fights that are still ahead. I will just say that in listening to your conversation there at the table, I do think there is absolutely no question about the future of the Republican Party right now. And it is, it, I think we're just still kind of grappling with the degree to which this is Donald Trump's party now and into the foreseeable future. Look at the primary rivals of him who have come back into the camp over the last couple of days and even over the last couple of hours. Mike Pence, Trump's former vice president, who's, you know, was turned on by Trump supporters on January 6th, the tune of people calling for his hanging, posting on X just a few minutes ago his congratulations to uh, President-elect Trump and to J.D. Vance, saying his prayers and support will be with them. Uh, Donald Trump is going to ride into Washington with the backing of a united Republican Party. Still a question of whether they'll have the House, but certainly the Senate, and there will be a lot that he can do, although in a fairly short amount of time. I was talking to one uh, longtime Republican, a major donor today, who remarked that you know because he comes in as a lame duck, because of the midterms, which will come up in two years, Trump will basically have one legislative session, and not to be too nerdy about it, probably one reconciliation bill, one Republican-only bill in that first year to try to get so many of his big priorities loaded up and done in a very short period of time. We're looking at a very busy Washington in early 2025 in this second Trump era. Lester? Okay, uh, Garrett, thanks very much. And uh, Tom Yamas is yeah. no doubt seeing numbers in his sleep. He draws maps <laughs> in his sleep now after, after the duty at the, uh, yeah. at, at the big board. Every vote counts, and right? And you're still counting. We're, we're still, still counting. counting. Every vote That's counts. That's what I was trying to vote get to. Out there. Uh, Maine has just, we're projecting that uh, Kamala Harris is going to win three of the four Maine uh, electoral votes there. Uh, one of the congressional districts is going to go towards former President Trump. Again, Maine, like Nebraska, it separates the way they give electoral votes, popular vote, and then congressional districts as well. As we look at the map here, still waiting on Nevada, still waiting on Arizona and Alaska, it looks like on the map there. But again, uh, the, a lot of the battlegrounds, a majority of the battlegrounds in the Trump column. Speaking of Trump, Lester, I, I had a flashback when we were talking about 2016 there. Uh, President-elect Trump got to work immediately. I remember going to Trump Tower for those meetings. You'll remember everyone was there from network news anchors to Kanye West as he was yes. building his cabinet and building his sort of plan of what he was going to do when he got to the White House. I wonder how quickly he's going to start. I think it's a great question because, remember, he has said he believes he has a mandate. He's been very clear about his agenda. He wants to start a mass deportation force immediately. He wants to slap huge tariffs on China. He wants to extend the Trump tax cuts. And by the way, Republicans are saying that's top of their agenda. So we will watch very closely to see how he begins to impose all of these, because particularly when it comes to the deportation plan, we haven't seen any firm proposals. So a lot of questions all about right. how that's actually well, My thanks to both out. of you, Hallie, as well. That concludes this NBC News special report. We'll have much more ahead on our streaming network, NBC News Now, online at NBCNews.com, and tonight on a special edition of NBC Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt in New York. Thank you for watching, everyone. Good day. We thank you.